Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? The Red River Institute, johnjdwyer.com, me, Gwen Falconer Lippert, and our signature sponsor, Atwoods, present Oklahoma Gold. Together with award-winning author and historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll stitch the golden threads of Oklahoma history. Here now on Oklahoma Gold. Hear their story, your story, it's our story. It's Oklahoma Gold. John J. Dwyer, North Korea to Norman? That's right, Gwen, and it's a long way, and it took a long time. And for years, I knew him only as the humble, soft-spoken, hard-working, Asian-American fellow who repaired my boots in Norman. Observing the traffic in and out of his boot and shoe repair shop, it grew clear that much of the rest of the town and surrounding area were also his customers. Eventually, when I came to write the Korean War section of Volume 2 of The Oklahomans, I inquired where he originally came from, South Korea. But his family came from North Korea before that. And what a story did he have to tell once I pulled it out of him. My young Duke Kim, Simon Kim here in America, was born in 1961 in Seoul, South Korea. His parents and older sister Peggy, however, came from Ham Hung, the second largest city in North Korea. Kwon Young Kim, Simon's father, was an expert watch repairman by trade. For years, he worked in a watch repair business run by the Japanese, who brutally occupied and enslaved all of Korea from 1910 until their defeat at the end of World War II in 1945. Kwon's talent and diligence gradually carried him to the top of the watch repair company's 12-person technical staff. He reported directly to the Japanese owner-overseer. When that man left at the time of the Japanese surrender in 1945, Kwan was able to gain ownership of the company. The departure of the Empire of the Rising Sun brought another colossal evil to Ham Hung and North Korea, communism. Joseph Stalin's Soviet Russia Empire installed a puppet government over the northern half of the Korean Peninsula. Kim Il-sung, grandfather of 2020's North Korea dictator Kim Jong-un, headed it. The United States championed a United Nations-backed democratic regime in the southern half. Simon Kim recalled for me the devout Christian beliefs that his father held from childhood. When he was as young as 15 or 16 years old, he went to church every day, five or six o'clock services in the morning, Simon remembered. He had to walk across two mountains to reach it. He was really, really Christian. He became an elder in his church when he was 40, and he was an elder until he died, both in Korea and in America. My whole family became Christian. That's the end of the quote. But in late 1940s and early 1950s, North Korea, according to Simon Kim, Christians had, quote, lots of trouble with communists. There was no religion allowed in North Korea. If you believed in Jesus, they kill you right away. North Korean Christians' lives depended on having very quiet, secret services in their houses, end quote. Kwan watched numerous friends and other people die brutal deaths at the hands of the communists. He told Simon that most of the surviving Christians in the entire nation of North Korea eventually fled south. The communists would sharpen long bamboo sticks into poles like pikes, Simon said, and run Christians through with them. The communists were very bad, and my father saw them do a lot of bad things, kill a lot of people, innocent people, people he knew. End of that quote. The area around Ham Hung, where the Kims lived, witnessed some of the most desperate fighting of the Korean War, indeed of the entire Cold War. In the early months of the war, Russian and Chinese supplied North Korea nearly drove United Nations forces, 90% of which were American, off the Korean Peninsula and into the sea. Then U.S. General Douglas MacArthur, renowned Supreme Allied Commander in the Pacific during World War II, unleashed his famous ambush at Incheon, behind the communist lines. This audacious mass amphibious assault in the heart of communist-held territory near the captured South Korean capital of Seoul succeeded in part 
because the Soviets, Chinese, and North Koreans alike considered it impossible to accomplish due to the terrain, violent tides, terrible navigation and landing straits, and proximity of enormous red military forces. But MacArthur and his boys, many of them Oklahomans, did it, led by the 1st Marine Division. Then they fought their way inland and liberated that great city of Seoul. All this triggered a rout of the North Koreans by the mostly American UN forces that nearly drove them out of the peninsula and back into China. At that point, Mao Zedong, the mass-murdering leader of communist China, unleashed a titanic red Chinese army on the Allies. Because U.S. President Harry Truman refused MacArthur's pleas to take whatever steps necessary to destroy that army, fearing such actions would trigger World War III, the American and United Nations forces were limited in their fighting options. Now they were pushed back to a line, which to this day divides North and South Korea. For two and a half years, the Americans held that line, repelling repeated communist attempts to conquer South Korea and thus saving that nation. Truman fired MacArthur over their disagreement. So what is the opinion of South Koreans of Mac? He is a hero, Simon Kim says simply. Well, the frozen Chozon carved their place into the annals of American history during the aforementioned 1st Marine Division's legendary late 1950 campaign around the enormous Chozon Reservoir near the Kim's home of Ham Hung. One of America's greatest military historians wrote, quote, The fighting at the Chozon Reservoir was the most violent small unit fighting in the history of American warfare, end quote. Mao unleashed his entire elite Ninth Army of 120,000 battle-hardened soldiers against the old breed First Division with a simple directive, destroy it. He envisioned a historic military and propaganda victory by vanquishing the cream of American fighting men. The Red Chinese outnumbered the Marines and supporting U.S. Army and British troops four to one. They surrounded them in friendly territory for the communists in some of the most bitterly cold weather of any American military campaign ever. For 17 straight days of hell, with little or no food, battling freezing and frostbite, frozen canteens, blood plasma, and morphine containers, and ground that required explosives just to dig foxholes in temperatures ranging from minus 20 to minus 35 degrees below zero. The Marines fought their way through endless waves of enemy soldiers toward a naval rescue on the Sea of Japan just south of Ham Hung. While losing several thousand men, the Americans destroyed six Chinese divisions, knocked nearly half of Mao's entire army on the peninsula out of the war until the following spring, and crushed his all-out attempt to destroy them. Captured Chinese intelligence revealed that Mao and his leadership concluded they could not subdue the Marines even if they threw every soldier in China against them. Fourteen Marines won the Medal of Honor in 17 days during the Battle of Chozon. In a moment, we'll find out what happened to the family of Simon Kim, the beloved 2020s boot and shoe repair maestro of central and southern Oklahoma during these terrifying events. And everybody in Norman knows Simon Kim. Now that's Oklahoma Gold. From North Korea to Norman? John J. Dwyer, how did that happen? Well, Gwen, with the savage Korean War, which slaughtered nearly three million people, including nearly 2 million Korean civilians, and most of us, if we've heard of it at all, it's just the name of the war. With that raging around Ham Hung and the communists continuing to terrorize Christians, Kwon Young Kim decided on a gamble of life-threatening peril to try and take his family to South Korea. He collected valuable watches and money through the years. He hid all of these in a large parka that his six-year-old daughter, Peggy, war as the family traveled south through communist North Korea, crossings, guard stations, checks on, on trains and other transportation amidst the carnage of the 20th century's worst forgotten war. My father knew that the communists searched adults but not children, Simon said. 
So the Kims survived this harrowing trek and settled in South Korean city of Cheongju and later Seoul. Kwon eventually continued his career as an expert watchman with a large South Korean company and raised daughter Peggy, Simon, and two more boys. Kwon and his wife legally immigrated to America in 1975, settling in the growing Korean community of Los Angeles. Elderly and speaking no English, he rose by 5 a.m. every morning to work all day, collecting scrap metal from any place he can find it, including trash cans. Simon remained in school in Seoul with his brothers until legally joining his family in L.A. in 1982. There he attended and graduated from El Camino College while working three part-time jobs. He met his Korean wife, Mija, or Janice, through family and friends during a ski trip to California's Big Bear Mountain. Her family had moved to Oklahoma when she was in junior high. She attended and graduated from OU. Simon and Janice hit it off immediately, and after the ski trip, corresponded in writing. They eventually married, and Janice joined Simon in L.A. He worked there for several more years, then in Houston, and then again in L.A. He owned beauty supply stores, grocery markets, a beef jerky wholesaler, worked additional part-times in gas stations and elsewhere to make a living for his family. Well, in 1999, Simon and Janice finally moved to Norman, Oklahoma. He bought the Norman boot and shoe repair shop from an older Korean immigrant who trained him in the new trade for all of one month, then retired. But I'm a very fast learner because my father, he was a technician of the watch, Simon said. I think I got a gene. I got DNA from him. As soon as I look at something, I know how to do it. I think people from central and southern Oklahoma would agree with that. Absolutely. Well, another employee of the store fortunately worked for a couple of more months and provided Simon a bit of additional further training before leaving him on his own. And in the more than two decades since, Simon Kim, and you and I both know him, has built a reputation from South Oklahoma City to Red River as the man to go to for boot, shoe, and leather repair. Meanwhile, in the 1990s, back in Ham Hung, the Kim family's city of origin, that large North Korean city from which Kwon led the family's death-defying escape, it suffered famine and starvation. Over 100,000 people starved to death in Ham Hung. An American journalist reported that the city's surrounding cemeteries are so vast they cover about the same amount of space as Ham Hung itself. Hmm. Simon Kim, meanwhile, recalls with thanksgiving the sacrifice made by so many of America's young men who gave up their own futures so that the suffering people of Korea might have one of their own. More than 36,000 American troops died. More than 100,000 suffered wounds. 5,000 went missing, and an undetermined number returned to towns and cities across Oklahoma and the U.S. with psychological scars. If not for these men... South Korea would never have evolved from a poor, unsanitary, long-subjugated land to the prosperous juggernaut from which arose Samsung, Hyundai, and numerous other industrial giants, a vibrant, free society, and one of the most Christian nations on earth. At the same time, its neighbor to the north, the totalitarian hermit kingdom of North Korea, whom MacArthur was not allowed to save, including Ham Hung, endures in poverty, fear, scarcity, periodic starvation, godless emptiness, and political terror. Simon and his wife Janice, meanwhile, living and thriving in Norman, Oklahoma, USA, have produced a whole pile of golden nuggets. I'm really happy with my life in America that I came here and stayed, concluded Simon Kim. I met my wife here, my children grew up here and graduated from OU and are working. Thank God, and thank God I'm a Christian. He wistfully recalled his parents' 75th wedding anniversary celebration in Los Angeles. Nearly 60 of their Korean-American children, grandchildren, and other relatives attended. A Korean newspaper published a large illustrated story. Simon's mother lived four more years after that celebration, dying during hers and Kwon's 80th year of marriage. And Kwon Young Kim, pilgrim, patriarch, man of courage, American died one month later. As John J. Dwyer says, Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Now that's Oklahoma gold. 